Tonight, a police force in crisis. Unauthorised surveillance, threats and intimidation of witnesses. The list just goes on. They were spying on you? They were spying on you. Frontline officers targeted. We're talking what? Bugs? Yeah. Listening devices? Yes. Absolutely. I looked at that information, it didn't leave my head. It never left my lips. Corruption within the ranks. Officers felt pressure to charge a person even when there's not enough evidence. They were saying I was corrupt and they were investigating me as a corrupt officer. Department had a target. Every shift had a target. Every officer had targets. The evidence they didn't want you to see. That's been scored out because they don't want that. I can't see the word fear. Is it in here? I look at this and I am so disappointed. And trouble at the very top. What about your background? My background as, as, a, as a police officer. The allegations of sexual assault. It's been five years since Scotland's eight police forces were merged into one. And the new national forces stumbled from crisis to crisis. I spent the last few months investigating what's gone wrong. I've discovered a culture of secrecy and suspicion, where target-driven policing has led to crime figures being manipulated and serious offences ignored, and corruption at the heart of the force. I begin by talking to as many officers as possible, serving and former. I want to know where they feel the problems began. Eventually, I get a call from one of the most senior-ranking officers around at the time of the merger. He tells me there were concerns that bad practice and corruption from some legacy forces had carried on into Police Scotland. He won't go on camera, but these are his words spoken by an actor. Some detectives were acting beyond their powers. They were cooking the books and skewing evidence of process. Management wanted to know why. These officers were putting their cases in jeopardy, and we thought it was a cultural thing of results at all costs. Management wanted to see how widespread this was and stop the extreme behaviour. It isn't long before I discover just how extreme. This is a document which I've had leaked to me. It's called the Quality Assurance Review. Um, it's dated November 2014. Uh, it was commissioned by the then Chief Constable, Sir Stephen House. The interesting bit is that I've also had leaked to me four previous versions of that report. Um, this is the first one. This is how it started life. Inside that first report, are three memos, each outlining bad practice, unlawful behaviour and serious corruption, and all committed by police officers. This one here is about two officers who were caught on camera speaking to a murder suspect at a police station. Apparently, they stood either side of the murder suspect, began to informally interview him and assert his guilt without cautioning him. And that goes against everything that the police are there to do. Uh, this one is from the Counter Corruption Unit, and they've been looking at the Tayside Drugs Branch. Uh, and it says the range of conduct issues identified is as follows unauthorised surveillance, threats and intimidation of witnesses, unauthorised searches, unlawful, spurious detentions of suspects colluding whilst compiling statements, failure to consider intelligence source protection issues. And, I mean, it just... the list just goes on. This is just the sort of corrupt behaviour my insider had told me about. None of it has ever been made public. I wondered whether those overseeing the force even knew about it. The Scottish Police Authority's job is to maintain policing standards and hold the Chief Constable to account. Moyali resigned from its board last year after a row over transparency. Brian Barber also resigned, citing government interference in how the police authority was run. I show them the memos. 
unauthorised surveillance, threats and intimidation of witnesses, unauthorised searches. Looks like really concerning stuff to me that I have not seen before. I've not... Allegations of this kind of behaviour have not, to my knowledge, been put to the board. Would the authority have known about this? As an internal matter, the authority wouldn't know about this until it came to a position where we were going through disciplinary and then it would come to the Conduct and Complaints Committee. I was a member both of the Complaints and Conduct Committee, which clearly this concerns, and also of the Audit and Risk Committee, which again, I think, would have a, a strong interest in these kinds of issues if there was a pattern of behaviour. Um, yes, I would certainly expect to know about this. And I didn't. It would suggest that in one particular area, then, there may be a systemic problem. Yes, I mean, these allegations are extremely serious. When I check the final version of the report, the memos are gone, and they're not the only omissions. The first version of the report is filled with quotes from officers. 334 in all were spoken to. Officers on the beat are almost bullied into producing returns to satisfy management. Questionable methods such as the recategorization of crime to meet targets. Officers may feel under pressure to fake stop search returns to boost the figures. In some instances, officers felt pressure to charge a person even when there's not enough evidence in order to meet targets. If you do not reach the targets, or you speak out against the impact of targets, you're either ignored or replaced. Yet none of these quotes appear in the final version. I look at this and I am so disappointed. Really? It's shocking. Yes. Worse than you thought it would be. I, n I never envisaged this, actually. I, I understand things go through a process. I would never have envisaged asking people their views and then misrepresenting them. If I had read this when I was on the board, I would have some very hard-hitting questions to ask and I would want answers and I would have gone about my role as a board member in a very different way. An entire section of the first report is called fear. And the word fear seems to come up over and over again. Fear of a backlash from the force executive. People are driven by fear. Fear of missing targets. Constant fear of being criticised. So how many times is that? One, two, three. So the word fear appears ten times in the first report. And looking in the final report, the word fear is just gone. I then begin to see the intervention of the Chief Constable's office. On the fourth version leaked to me, Sir Stephen House's handwriting is on it, as well as somebody else's. The title page is expressions of fear and anxiety. But that's been scored out, because they don't want that. They want it to now be called culture and communications. And if I look in the final report, it's culture and communications. The word fear has gone. Completely. I can't see the word fear. Is it in here? No. That's why I can't see it then. So it's in here ten times and it's not in here. The service talks about integrity to take a culture of fear and translate it into culture of communications isn't something um, that carries integrity. Another striking feature is the attempts from the very top to rewrite problems into the past tense. Problems which affect the force becomes affected. Is becomes was. This bit here, communication in Police Scotland requires urgent and significant improvement. They've changed that to required. Then an email is leaked to me, which shows the Chief Constable doesn't just want to change the report, he's prepared to bury it altogether. The email refers to a meeting which they had about the report and a single word which Sir Stephen House still wants changed. The Chief will not allow the report to be tabled unless this is amended.
The email explains where the word is and it says, it's in the sentence, it's clear that much anxiety and uncertainty as to what was expected remains among staff at operational unit level. The proposal is to change the word remains to existed. Now, apparently this was almost a last straw from the chief and there's a danger that he will suppress this unless amended. The email then states that to change the word to existed doesn't state that feelings weren't discovered by the review. It just simply doesn't mention that these feelings may still exist. A play on words, I know. It then says that if the amendment is agreed to, then the report would be tabled. Do you notice the tense changes? And this oh, is a common theme. How interesting. It's giving the impression that there was an issue and the issue has been addressed, when in fact the report hasn't been presented yet, so the issue clearly can't have been addressed. I am shocked that the Chief Constable's office should see fit to try to pretty much obliterate any kind of criticism whatsoever because if this is what the report found then this is what it found and this is what should have been published. It has been changed and diluted and the message that's come out isn't the view of those who expressed it in the first place. It makes me feel as though I've been part of an organisation that has let people down. Really? Yes. The reason the report was commissioned in the first place was to tackle misconduct within the ranks. I show the various different drafts to an organisation that investigates and tackles corruption around the world. They've had time to look at the papers, so I'm going to call him now. This is Robert Barrington, the director. Mm -hmm. Robert. Hi, Hello. Hello. Thanks very much for taking this call. You've had time to look at the papers. It's very clear that uh, there's a really substantial difference between the original version mm. in draft and the final report that went to the board. Did it sit comfortably with you? Uh, what you have over the course of the draft is something that becomes steadily uh, less transparent, less challenging, uh, probably something that's less of a comfortable environment for people who were trying to um, highlight cases of corruption and highlight... Um, uh, issues that were going on inside the force. When you have a culture that doesn't um, operate transparently uh, and doesn't encourage people to uh, speak out, those are actually the conditions in which corruption can thrive rather than which it's really exposed. That's really interesting. From what he's saying basically was they were investigating allegations of corruption. That was the reason behind this report. And yet it would seem from what we've discovered uh, that this isn't a culture which is conducive to actually tackling corruption. Former Chief Constable Sir Stephen House, who commissioned the report, declined to comment. Police Scotland told us significant changes have been implemented since the report was written, and last year it launched a wellbeing strategy for all officers and staff. The report, the differing versions, the editing, the apparent rewriting of history, it all calls into question the integrity of policing at that time. The main reason the review was commissioned was to root out bad practice and corruption within the ranks. Yet I was to hear the same allegations made against the very unit set up to tackle it. I'm innocent. The question is, are you? In TV world, it's known as AC12, made famous by the BBC drama Line of Duty. I'm just doing my job. And I'm doing mine. And it's called Nick and Ben Coppers. And I don't care whether it's one rotten apple or the whole bloody barrel. In real life, this was the head of Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit until 2013. It was his job to go after the rotten apples. The corruption unit deal with all criminality in respect of uh, allegations against police officers or members of police staff. That could be anything from drug misuse, drug supply, theft, fraud. One of the unit's biggest concerns was about leaks from within the force. Officers selling information to journalists and to organised crime groups. 
what they could do was utilise that officer to obtain information from policing systems that would help their individual crime enterprises. And the means of investigating that are exactly the same means that we use to investigate criminality uh, within the wider population. So monitoring their own telephone billing, covert methods, intrusive methods, round about the officer's home, car, place of work, um, and down to recording of conversations. We're talking, what, bugs? That's correct. Cameras? Yeah. Listening devices? Yes. Absolutely. The CCU was obliged to report every suspected data protection breach. Officers whom they believed were accessing the police intelligence database with no justifiable policing purpose. This meant some officers who claimed they were using the system to help solve crimes instead found themselves labelled corrupt and facing prosecution. Alan. Hi. Sam, nice to meet you. Thanks so much. Alan Cotton was a detective based in Glasgow. In 2009, there was an attempted murder in Ayrshire. A serious incident. There was firearms and machetes involved, and the victim nearly lost an arm. An eyewitness with a criminal background contacted him to pass on information about the attack. Alan Cotton looked at reports linked to the crime, even though it wasn't his case. I mean, would that have been normal for you to have looked at that? It would be normal for any professional uh, detective to do so. You don't want to be uh, going to senior investigating officers and wasting their time with information that's inaccurate. You didn't do anything with it? You didn't sell it to anyone or...? No, not at all. See what you've just done there and say you didn't sell it. That's an automatic response people would make. People would think that. Or oh, you must have sold information, because that's, that's what generally the public would think data protection offence would be, that you've taken that information and you've misused it. What I did is I looked at that information. It didn't leave my head. Never left my lips. Never wrote it down. Never sent any intimation of it to anyone. The counter-corruption unit accused him of misusing the information. He was reported for a data protection offence. The criminal case was deserted on the eve of the trial, but an internal police inquiry found him guilty of a procedural breach. After a 21-year otherwise unblemished career, Alan Cotton left the force, believing he was a victim of the CCU. They had targets the same as everybody else. Every department had a target, every shift had a target, every officer had targets, and you were expected to meet those or exceed them. And if you didn't, you were taken to task. Do you genuinely believe that the counter-corruption unit had to justify their existence? That, that's absolutely what it was. Absolutely, they had to justify their existence. What was the most common allegation against officers? Without a doubt, data protection offence. Data protection? Yeah. Why? because it's a low-hanging fruit. A report by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary into the counter-corruption unit discovered that instead of concentrating on proactive anti-corruption investigations, as was its remit, they were focusing on data protection offences. Between 2013 and 2017, 118 police officers were reported to the Crown Office for a data breach. Only two were ever successfully prosecuted. What would you say to those who would argue that these data protection breaches were low-hanging fruit? They were easy gets. Absolutely not. It was always the last part of the inquiry. The criminality alleged was the first part of the inquiry would investigate and data protection was something that was... It came in the wash-up of something that we had to report to the Procurator Fiscal. You know when you're, you're using any force asset or communication tool if you're doing it for a purpose that isn't for a policing purpose. To call it low-hanging fruit would, would not be true? No. I put this to Ian Livingston, who's been the acting chief constable since September. Thank nice to see you. Much. Thank you. A number of the cases you're talking about were all cases that emerged from some of the legacy forces, um, where it has taken an awful long time 
through the Crown and through other uh, agencies involved in the justice system. And when these cases came to court, there was either an insufficiency or the evidence uh, was not appropriate. My primary objective is to prevent any breach so that people are properly trained, people understand what the responsibilities are and use the data appropriately. But absolutely, uh, unapologetically, if people are abusing data, if people are, are disclosing that to people they should not be doing that to, they must be held to account for that. But the key element regarding criminality and, and the abuse of data protection laws, we've made significant improvements in that through Police Scotland. The CCU's robust pursuit of officers proved deeply unpopular among the rank and file. But it was the tactics it deployed in one particular case which put the corruption unit firmly in the headlines. It was in this isolated woodland in Lanarkshire where the body of a young woman was found in May 2005. She was Emma Caldwell. Her killer has never been found. Ten years later, a Sunday newspaper took another look at her case. This is what appeared in the Sunday Mail. Now, crucially, it contained specific details about the police case and how the murder inquiry had ignored a man believed to be a suspect. Now, I remember reading this at the time and feeling quite excited to see what the police were going to do next. We now know exactly what that was. David Moran was a detective inspector in Glasgow. The Emma Caldwell inquiry, were you involved in that? No, not in any At way all. whatsoever, no. So what happened? Um, what happened was that the 5th of April 2015, um, I read an article uh, in uh, the Sunday Mail which purported to expose a forgotten suspect in Emma Caldwell murder inquiry. I could see the journalist that had written it, but I also could see um, that an ex-colleague of mine had been closely involved in compiling the information for, for the article. They must have had access to detailed information, which <laughs> I knew right away that the police would, would be furious that that information had got out. Instead of reopening the murder investigation, Police Scotland put its energies into finding the leak. The counter-corruption unit made these applications, applying for permission to access phone records and text details of several officers. David Moran was one of its targets. Yet the CCU hadn't sought the necessary approval of a judge, making the applications unlawful. They were spying on you? They were spying on me, yes. Through your phones? Through my phones, yes. It made me feel a mixture of uh, anger, disappointment, disgust, surprise Because even. these were tactics which you had been using for years against other people, against murder suspects. Indeed. Serious organised crime They obviously food. identified me as a suspect for leaking information that appeared in the Sunday Mail. So you're, it... you're, you're David Moran, corrupt cop? Yeah. And it's, it's like there's been no move by Police Scotland to put that right, and that's what, that's what I crave. And meanwhile, Emma Caldwell's family just have to sit and wait. I feel so bad for Emma Caldwell's mother that she's sitting listening to me moaning about my phone getting looked at, my phone details getting looked at, when she's lost her daughter and hasn't had any proper answers over it. I, and I do feel bad about that. Police Scotland eventually apologised to all the officers who were targeted by the CCU and reopened the investigation into the murder of Emma Caldwell. Do you look back on that episode with, with what? Concern? It was very poorly handled by the then counter-corruption unit at the time and mistakes were made, errors of judgement were made. The structure and leadership and management of the counter-corruption unit needed changed and, and it has been changed. It did need change. You accept yeah. it needed change. Absolutely. And, and I, I repeat the apology that we made to, to, to the individuals involved in it and, and their families. That shouldn't have taken place. And we as an organisation will continue to focus on trying to detect the murder of Emma Caldwell because that's the key thing for, 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 for the, um, coming out of, mm. of these sets of circumstances. The overzealous pursuit of data breaches and unlawful spying on officers are just two of the scandals to have hit Police Scotland since it began. Industrial scale stop and searches. Armed officers on routine patrols. We need justice! 
the death of Sheikh Ubayu in custody, and the couple left dying for days in a crashed car by the M9. Their deaths sealed the departure of Sir Stephen House in 2015. But for me, the time has come to move on to take up new opportunities. His replacement was Philip Gormley. I will faithfully discharge the duty. As the office of constable. As the office of constable. He only lasted two years, quitting over bullying allegations, which he denies. Deputy Chief Constable Ian Livingstone stepped in as high-profile suspensions of officers rocked the force. There's no crisis in policing. But are there questions about his own suitability for the role? I've just searched Ian Livingstone's uh, name online, and the fourth entry to come up is this one, which talks about allegations of sexual misconduct made against him in 2003. Now, that was when he was at the Lothian and Borders Force. A female constable claimed she was sexually assaulted by Ian Livingstone at Tully Allen Police Training College. No criminal charges were brought, but he was heavily reprimanded by his own force for inappropriate conduct. He was taken down four ranks. He appealed and was reinstated. What about your background? My background as, as, a, as a police officer. The allegations of sexual assault, you ended up admitting misconduct staying in the room of a junior officer. You were bumped down from superintendent to constable and suspended, am I right? No, not in that. that no, you're not right. You, that, you no. weren't taken down from superintendent to constable? No, I, you, I wasn't taken down from superintendent to constable and then, and then suspended. There was, there was a, a set of circumstances in, 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 in 2000 um, whereby uh, at a social event um, at Tully Allen, at a training event, um, I had too much to drink, I fell asleep in the wrong place, and, and that was wrong, and, and I shouldn't have done that, and, 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 and clearly I accept that. I was suspended, I spent time off work. Um, there was a hearing convened where I did accept, I fell asleep, I was cleared of any sexual impropriety, uh, I was cleared of any uh, level of sexual intent, um, and at that hearing, initially, I was, I was then demoted from superintendent to, to, to constable. Uh, I immediately appealed against that and I was reinstated. Uh, I came back to work, I accepted, uh, that I'd made a mistake, I accepted that I'd learned from it, uh, and since that time I've continued to conduct my duties with absolute uh, rigour uh, and, and, and professionalism. The public wants a strong professional leader with integrity in their Chief Constable, is that you? I think I could uh, discharge the responsibilities of the job. One of my main strengths, I think, is the ability to work collectively and, 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 and to, to work in a collegiate manner. Um, I do think I could do the job. I just need to be quite clear in my own mind that, that that's what I want to do for the next three to five years. Integrity, fairness and respect are the very values upon which policing in Scotland is based. Yet I wonder where they can be seen in what I've found. The pressure on officers to meet targets. The silencing of those on the front line and the rewriting of history by those whose job it was to lead. Police Scotland is looking for its fourth Chief Constable in as many years. How will they fix a force in crisis?